Hello, everyone, and welcome. We'll get started in a few minutes. Good morning and good afternoon. Welcome everyone to the ransomware live panel discussion on ransomware and the impact to business. I'd like to take a moment to introduce our moderator, Todd Fitzgerald. Todd has built Fortune 500 large company security programs for 20 years. He was named 2016-17 Chicago CISO of the Year, ranked top 50 information security executive, authored four books, including the number one best-selling and 2020 Canon Hall of Fame winner, CISO Compass, navigating cybersecurity leadership challenges with insights from pioneers, groundbreaking CISO leadership, essential principles for success, as well as contributions to dozens of others. Todd held senior leadership positions at Northern Trust, Grant Thomas International, Manpower Group, WellPoint, Anthem, Blue Cross Blue Shield, National Government Services, Zeneca, IMS Health, and American Airlines. I'd like to thank Todd and the panelists here today and welcome. Todd, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Lana. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here today with this uh, great set of panelists uh, and talking about a topic that is very important to all of us. Um, we do have the Cybersecurity Collaborative uh, in conjunction with Cyber Reason produces a podcast called CISO Stories. And this will be one of those episodes as well, where we take a deep dive uh, looking at uh, some of our top chief security officers uh, and security leaders that have built a lot of the standards. Uh, and we interview them and condense that down into a 20, 25 minute podcast. Uh, which can be, uh, you know, downloaded from your uh, favorite podcast platform. Um, so without any further delay, uh, we have this excellent report today uh, called Ransomware and the Impact to Business, a study that was done from looking at 1,200 security uh, professionals and getting information uh, about uh, the ransomware that we have today. I'll quickly introduce the panelists. Uh, we have Sam Curry who is the Chief Security Officer for Cyber Reason. Uh, Sam uh, formerly worked with RSA. Uh, and in that time with RSA, um, he has uh, 20 over 20 patents uh, to his name in his, in his role as a security architect, uh, very knowledgeable in this space. Uh, we have Carissa Varma. Uh, Carissa Varma is with Old Mutual Limited. Uh, which is one of the largest financial services company uh, in the continent of uh, Africa. Uh, so welcome today, Carissa, great to have you here. Uh, she has a lot of insights to share. Uh, and we have Frank Johnson. Uh, Frank Johnson is the uh, former CIO for the city of Baltimore. As we know, the city of Baltimore experienced uh, a ransomware attack uh, and great to have uh, uh, Frank's insights uh, in this call. And finally, uh, and not least, we have Brian Hurd, uh, who is with, uh, 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 I'm sorry, the uh, Chief of Office for Aon Cyber. Uh, uh, Brian has uh, quite a career. Uh, he established the uh, first cyber counterintelligence unit uh, with NCIS, uh, with the, with the uh, US Navy. Uh, and he has been in uh, investigating and a lead uh, a forensics investigator for many different uh, ransomware uh, attacks. Um, so uh, with this panel, I think we'll have lots of lots of insights. Um, the study came out with a lot of great findings. And what I really like about this is we're talking about the business of ransomware and the impact. Uh, and, and without uh, further ado, I wanna turn it over to Sam uh, and take us through the first set of these findings. Sure. Thank you, Todd. Um, and uh, thanks to the other panelists for being here as well. The, uh, as you mentioned, the survey was over 1,200 security professionals, and it was 
uh, all industries more or less, um, Southeast Asia, Africa, North America, Europe. Um, so it really did, was a good uh, sampling. And I would say the vast majority of organizations have experienced some degree of pain from ransomware and that became evident from the survey. So, um, you know, 66% of these organizations reported some type of loss of revenue associated with downtime and an inability to maintain service. 53% of them represented uh, reported brand and reputation damage. This, this, it's more than just the money you're not making. It is the long-term trust and goodwill that gets hammered here. 32% um, of organizations reported losing C-level talent. Um, and, and presumably there were a few CISOs in there, although we didn't get to that granularity in the survey. And 29% reported layoffs following a ransomware attack, um, which, is a, which is pretty rough, um, especially, uh, especially at right now. So losing a lot of employees, uh, damage to the business, damage to the brand, this is long lasting impact to the business. Yeah, well, thank you, Sam. And and what I would like everybody to do on the call is as we're going through these different points, if you have any questions, please put that in the in the question and answer section, uh, and we will address those uh, near the end of the end of the webinar as many as we can get to. Um, Carissa, is there is there anything that surprises you out of these findings? Yeah, Todd, I think um, you know. I always understood that ransomware was had a major impact. I think for the first time, we're starting to see real hard metrics and statistics about how big that impact is. If I look across that, I mean, one in three, um, you know, 30%, one in three people actually impacted to a scale where they um, have layoffs. I mean, that's an enormous statistic, even though that's the smallest number on that screen. Um, but when you look in the knock on impacts of something like ransomware on your economy, uh, on job creation, on it, it's quite massive um, to just take a step back and look at that statistic. Um, and I think the impacts that are starting to really worry me the most um, are what we're seeing in um, our critical infrastructure. I mean, um, in the US, you guys had uh, the Colonial Pipeline um, ransomware. Um, our ports in South Africa have recently been impacted. Um, during COVID, a number of hospitals were taken offline because, um, you know, due to ransomware. And um, you know, if we don't collectively act to improve our position, uh, we're going to be left very vulnerable, not, as, not just as organizations, but as people. Um, you know, we're going to be feeling impacts to our, our livelihoods, to our medical care, to uh, our water, our power, our electricity, our ability to, to access goods. Um, it's going to start um, physically impacting us. Um, and so that was probably one of the biggest and hardest hitting stat for me. Um, and probably not one that's been covered before in other data. So um, a really definitely a hard hitting one there, Todd. De definitely. Um, you know, what, what about, um, you know, the, these layoffs? Do you, where do you think they're occurring in the business? Is it within the security teams or is it, is it a widespread um, type of scenario? Yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult to tell. I think it would depend on the type of business. Um, I mean, you can imagine a retailer going offline for a period of a few months. If it's a small mom and pop shop, um, you know, you're going to have layoffs and staff that are actually on the floor servicing customers. Um, so it, it really depends on the type of business. Um, uh, the, the interesting stat about the C-level talent that's being lost there as well. Uh, and I agree with Sam, I'm pretty sure there's a number of CISOs in there um, you know, that had heads to the chopping block um, um, due to some really bad ransomware attacks. I can imagine that that would have been the case. So Frank, what, what, are, your, what are your thoughts around that? You know, Todd, you and I have talked about this before. You know, we uh, thankfully it feels like we're on the tail end of what I'll call victimizing the victim. You know, we all know for those of us in the business, there's no such thing as perfect security or zero vulnerability. And we're way past that cliche of it's not a matter of if, but when. And, you know, it just pains me personally to see somebody going on a witch hunt internally in an organization looking for somebody to blame. I mean, for Pete's sake, when somebody breaks into your neighbor's house, do you blame your neighbor for not having a strong enough deadbolt on their back door? Of course not. Well, why do we do that here in cybersecurity? So I, I think these numbers, Todd, based on surveys I've seen in the past were much higher a few years ago. Thankfully, they're trending down and we're focusing on the business at hand. 
well-intentioned, hardworking people doing the best that they can with resources available to protect the environment. And again, it's, you know, there's no such thing as personal, per perfect security or zero vulnerability, and we're way past that. You know, it's not a matter of if, but when. It's just inevitable. It's gonna happen to everyone. Brian? I agree, and I think uh, some of the some of the issues are for the small and medium businesses, the mom and pa shops that make up ninety percent of the fabric of the world, they go out of business, and I think that is highlighted in the report that Sam and the team put together, and in other discussions, it is a enterprise-ending event for many of them, especially if they can't pay the ransom, don't have insurance, all all sorts of other things. We'll be talking about that later. Also, the we talk about some of the costs, but many of the breaches, the costs go into five, 10 years of stakeholder, stockholder litigation. And the final thing I'll say just to round out is, we had a saying in the community, and it's, I haven't heard it lately, so I'm gonna, re, I'm gonna resuscitate it. As a CISO, it's not that you had a breach that ends your career, it's that you couldn't manage one that ends your career. And it's not that you had a fire, it's that you're not a good firefighter when you had one. And I think that as we look at the liability or, or who should be let go after an event like that, if that chief information security officer has a good roadmap, but it's underfunded, that's a different discussion for the board than an incompetent security team, um, which is more on the board's liability and role. But again, those are just the, the broad brush. And, and for Frank especially, as one of the first CISOs of a city to go through ransomware, he is nowhere near the last in the class of 2020 or 2021. So he's right, it is becoming way more common. But for those of you that are the first, thank you, Frank, you handled it well. Well, you, you, you mentioned something, Brian, I hope that we continue to explore, you know, and that this all starts and stops with leadership. You know, I mean, leadership plays an important role in protecting their environment through their attitude with risk management, risk posture. Cy investments in cybersecurity and protection should flow out of a well-informed risk uh, uh, capability, and that starts with leadership. So, you know, if leadership's looking for somebody to blame, I hope that if, if there is an event in their environment and enterprise, they're taking a good hard look in the mirror. You know, I've seen some situations where the, the chief security officer was kept on after the breach because that's the person that you need to help manage your way out of the breach. Uh, and I've seen some job descriptions where the actual job requirement is must have had experience in handling a breach, where years ago that would have been something uh, that, that, that you wouldn't have put on, on your resume, right? The scarlet so, letter. <laughs> yeah. So, so how do we how do we grasp with the with the potential fallout from a, a ransomware attack? Anybody want to take that one? Well, some of it's here, Todd. Some of it is brand reputation damage. Uh, but I think if we think about it and and play it CFO for a moment, if we think about it as a P and L, when the revenue line vanishes, the impact to margin massive because the costs stay. And so not only do you have the loss of revenue, you've now got the loss of goodwill, the partners who are going, can you manage your business? Do you know what you're doing? Are you taking accountability for this? Uh, you know, having, having been in breaches myself, you can be a, a hero or you can be a villain in these situations. You can't play the victim. So how the CEO conducts themselves is important as well. But the, the knock-on impact of this means that costs go up during a breach. So if you think about that as in your head, revenue goes down, margin vanishes, negative, negative cash flow, and costs go up. It's no wonder that people are being let go in those situations, especially thin margin businesses. Yeah. Sam, you make good. a really Go ahead, Krista. Sam, you make a good point. And, and um, those costs and that impact is sometimes quite long lasting. I mean, um, you know, some businesses bounce back, back up and, and they can, um, and navigate it quite quickly, but some take a while to actually bounce back. So it's quite long lasting. Um, you know, where, where other, um, other major issues, you have a brand or reputational impact for a period of time, people get over it. Um, I've, I've seen cyber attacks where companies actually take quite a bit of time to actually get the trust back because it's all about the business of trust. As soon as, as, soon as you've lost that trust, 
it's very difficult to rebuild that brand of trust again. Um, and that impact is actually felt, you know, every time your customer looks at you, or every time your customer thinks about doing business with you for a long time ahead before, you know, the next headline hits the news and uh, it becomes old news. Very, very good point. Sam, any other um, things we should know about, you know, the impact of security? And I know you have a, a full report uh, behind this that can be downloaded from uh, Cyber Reason as well, which goes through this. But any other points you want to add before we move on to the next site? I do want to echo what, what Frank started uh, earlier, because I even saw a tweet online from a CISO saying anyone who's been through a breach should not be hired again. And I thought, you know, this actually breaches are a chance for learning. Um, I did a presentation recently, the title of which was My Four Greatest Failures uh, as, a, as a CISO. And the only, the only egotistical thing there is that it implies there were only four. Um, you know, and, and so it's in sharing our learnings like that. Not only is there a chance for leadership, there's a chance for everybody to benefit from it. Um, I was involved, as, as some of you know, in the RSA breach over a decade ago now, and we recently came out with details on it. So even those learnings still continue today. So I think it's, it's withhold judgment, and I've seen CISOs in the last 12 months suffer things like ransomware and be given more responsibility afterwards because they finally get a chance to shine. Look, the biggest problem in security is alignment to the business. What, what could better prove that you're a business person than being able to handle a business in crisis? Yeah, excellent point. Well, let's move on to the next piece because Brian kind of hinted on it a, a little bit around the cost of all of this. Well, there's, there's one cost and one question that keeps coming up to pay or not to pay. So Sam, what were the findings of the uh, study that you did? Yeah, uh, and, and it's really hard to quantify from most of the sources we've seen out there just how big is this problem. And so one of the, 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 the staggering findings was that 80% who paid a ransom were attacked again. So looking at those that have said, hey, we paid the ransom, we're back to normal. That question of is there honor among thieves? Uh, it doesn't appear that way. Right? Do you get the keys back? And the FBI will tell you you shouldn't pay, but if you do, here's a trustworthiness score of the people who ransomed you and whether or not they're likely to give you the key. And then if you get, get the key and you decrypt, do they come back? Do peers come back? 46% uh, who paid regained access, so only about half, but some or all of that data was corrupted. So even if you get it back, even if you decrypt it, think of all the connections into that data that suddenly are hamstrung or cut. Uh, and, and, and the downtime, and recovery is under ideal conditions, difficult when you have data loss. Now you're talking about reconnecting and hoping the patient is still alive. 42% reported that cyber insurance policies didn't cover all the losses. And we've seen policy prices go up. I know there's some insurance folks that are present here. Um, we've seen um, the, the exclusions about what gets paid and what doesn't. Those have increased in terms of number. And uh, I have to say, I've seen municipalities because their data is public. And when we had a, prior to 2020, we had a quote, people said an epidemic at the time of attacks and ransomware going against municipalities. If you look at the spending data, they didn't increase security spend, they increased insurance spend. That, that's like, if you think you're gonna get sick, increasing your life insurance, but not getting health insurance. Interesting concept, uh, uh, statistics here. So Brian, the, do you think that the ransomware payments are exacerbating the problem by encouraging more attacks? Uh, and I'll do a couple of broad brushes and take stage direction from both you and Sam. Great report and great findings. Um, one, the question is, you know, uh, no, the criminals will find other victims, period. And one of the things that I think that and like with the CISO discussion we we're having, one of the missed contexts is if somebody kidnaps your child, it's not like you decide whether you like paying terrorists or not. It's to get your child back or your business back. So nobody desires to pay ransomware. Nobody wants to support criminals. That's the whole point of extortion. You really are beyond the choice at that point, unless you can recover your data from backups. And then if you're trying to pay just to you know, keep it quiet, the regulators don't let that happen. So that's wasted money. You might as well just gear up for the client calls you're gonna have to make and the public affairs nightmare you're gonna go through 
and spend the money on recovery and restoration from backups and redoing your IT more than paying it to the adversary, and then you're five million or 10 million ahead. I've worked dark sides all year and, and so, so many others we can talk about as needed, but the other couple of top level things related to this report is the cyber insurance policies, the market is hardening. Sam has it nailed, the, the, uh, the things are going up. But one of the other things we can talk about later is, and the cyber insurance market is supposed to do this because, and Carissa, as you know, because they do root cause analysis, the nine root causes are brought back into the qualifications questionnaire for, for cyber insurance. So those CISOs that think they can spend their way on insurance out of it, the qualification form for cyber insurance, I'll put it in the context of home insurance. If you don't have smoke detectors, you're not getting a home policy either. Um, so if you don't have multi-factor auth and the other nine root causes of, of, of ransomware, you're not gonna get coverage. The other small nuance, and it's very important when, like I deployed a team of 30 on one client, that initial outlay and Sam nailed it. You're spending money like, you're, you're paying for flavored water on your fire, you feel like. Um, and I mean that literally, but the spend on the water is gonna be a rounding error by the time you're done with the corporate liability, business interruption, contractual obligations and other things, but it doesn't feel like that when they're pouring gallons of water on your fire. So I think there's a little bit of additional context or misperception about why insurance's role in the community is to make airbags and seatbelts. Car companies didn't do that. Um, or steam engine relief valves for Carissa and I's uh, olden days. Um, they, you probably, if you're gonna go get cyber insurance now because you're not willing to spend on security, you won't qualify for insurance. And the other thing during response, just like with a fire rebuild, People are trying to improve security at the same time they're trying to be restored to the state at which they started the calamity. That's not covered by insurance. Improvements aren't covered. So you have to be very regimented in costs of the firefight and the rebuilding of the destroyed house to make sure they are not commingled. And that's why some of the people are saying it didn't cover all the losses. I'd be interested to see how many were losses and how many were improvements. And that's a nuance that, unfortunately, I hope many CISOs never go through. I'll pause there because, you know, we could go on every topic for an hour or so, uh, but glad to go into detail on some of that. But the other, the other thing is, will they come back because you pay? No, they'll come back because you're weak. They'll extort you a second time. It has nothing to do whether you paid or not. Um, it's just, you know, you get hit. When they know you pay, yeah, they'll put you on a list, but they're still gonna come around anyway. So it's being the slower gazelles is your problem, not whether you paid previously for extortion or not. Yeah, Tyler, I mean, all of these are my personal opinion, not reflective of my organization, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> <laughs> if we didn't land them. We'll let you have the disclaimer. Uh, Frank, you had comments? Uh, you know, I've got pretty strong feelings in this space. You and I have talked about it in the past. And the point that's missing here is first and foremost, paying the ransom does not speed up your recovery. Let me repeat that again. Paying the ransom does not speed up your recovery if your goal is to recover in a place where you're more safe and secure post-incident than where you were pre-incident. Now, I have heard stories and actually worked with some individuals who paid the ransom, got the keys, decrypted production systems, which were formerly encrypted, and threw them back into production. I got in a what could still be a compromised network. I got one word that comes to mind for me. I don't know about the rest of you. It's called reckless. You know, there are certain stages when you are recovering systems that thou must go through before they're ever put back into production in a safe network. And then slowly but surely with that right system and administrators help, you know, reconnect users who have themselves been cleaned. I mean, there are several stages to go through. So again, in my, in my humble opinion, paying the ransom does not does not speed up your recovery now we've met you know brian mentioned this earlier this all stops with having a really good backup and recovery plan you know so as part of your incident response planning good backups make sure that they're clean check them regularly because you'll never know when you're going to need to pull them down and use them as a base in order to start to recover post some ransomware incident Chris, so where do you stand on, on paying the ransom? 
Go you know, ahead. you know what, Todd, as I'm listening to this, I'm thinking, I uh, hear so uh, this is such a popular question to pay or not to pay. And I wonder if we spend too much time on a question that we will need post the event rather than thinking about what we need before the event. Um, and you see, you see this happen over and over again. Um, you know, companies are willing to fork out huge amounts of money, uh, you know, to do amazing things post an incident. Um, but to make that change before you actually get the breach, it's really a, a very difficult um, business case to make. It's a very difficult um, thing to put forward to say, actually, we need this. Um, and organizations that are that are not hearing the plea of security people that says we need this so that you know what happened next door doesn't happen to us um and we're talking about do we pay or we do not do we not pay that should not be the question the question should be how do i prevent this exactly what frank is saying do i have robust backups um do i have a strong edr do i have a strong patching policy uh, am i using multi-factor authentication um are my mail systems secure you know, all of those good hygiene stuff, that's what the question's about. That's the real question we should be asking ourselves. Because once you get to the question of to pay or not to pay, it's too late. Yeah. It's out the door. Um, so in my mind, I actually think we spend too much time asking ourselves this question and not enough other questions. And so one other one other note, and I know we're going to get Carissa in the next topic to prepare to fail or fail to prepare. So I just wanted to land one other note based on Sam's report. The 46% who paid regained access data, but some all was corrupted. So even if you end up having to pay because your backups aren't good enough, and Frank, 100% right, Chris, 100% right. The things, there's about an 80 or 90% return rate on the decryption. However, the 10% is large files over a couple of terabytes or megabytes, which is usually all of your backups and email repositories, or, and Sam, you nailed it, things in flight when they were encrypted, because these people don't care. Um, they'll claim to have a help desk that helps you with decryption for a year, whatever. Um, my feelings on that are, you know, confident. Um, and when you're trying to decrypt these things, you do have to put them in a clean room. Frank, and it's like taking a toothbrush and trying to get mold off of plates if your house flooded. Like, you're going to eat off that? Really? You're, it's not, you're not done scrubbing it yet. So you have to have a clean room, you have to have fresh images from the start, but the things that will fail are probably the crown jewels of your business, even if it's in the last 5%. The rest of it will decrypt fine, but that's not the part you care about. So it is heavily biased toward the things that most often are critical to the business about what fails decryption. So the report talks also about the, the problem with double extortion where where the you know attackers are encrypting your information but then they're also taking a copy of it and threatening to post it is another way to to get you to pay that ransom so what do we do about those situations i'll take a short version then i'll hand to the panel because i, I kind of covered a little bit before is uh look you're, if you have to report it to regulators and you have to report it to the sec and it's going to become public knowledge then really you're only paying for a delay of embarrassment which i think is a waste so the extortion is just to add urgency to the ransomware. So you have the encryption extortion and the exfiltration and publication extortion. But again, that's where you have an executive tabletop in advance and say, look, we've made our backup plans so we can recover from the encryption. The, we've hopefully imp implemented security you guys are gonna talk about in a minute. But the C, this is the Johnson & Johnson Tylenol you know, scandal from Chicago. What kind of company are you? You're paying hush money at that point, and you might as well just spend that money on your PR program and on a better security and just gut through it because whatever you got there. So I, some, I of our, think some of our listeners may not, not really remember. Oh, go ahead, Todd. Sorry. Sorry, I was just going to say some of our listeners may not remember the Johnson Johnson Tylenol. Oh, for you younger kids, um, one, of the, <laughs> one of the best studies in all of the MBA programs in the world was when a company is faced, uh, Johnson Johnson was faced with the uh, poisoning by some person running around, I think it was Chicago, um, and they removed, they made a decision whether they were just going to say it's only in Chicago, or they removed all Tylenol from the shelves of every store in the United States, and they made the decision by not talking about technology, not talking about numbers, not talking about shipping. They looked at their credo of what founded the corporation, and they made a decision to do the right thing 
and worry about the cost later. They, they went with an ethical decision. And I've used that study sitting in a boardroom with a dark-sided board ransomed, figuring about whether what they're going to do. I use it every day. I don't throw that randomly. I use it in my consulting. Um, oh, we, we used it in yeah. 2011 as well uh, yeah. at RSA. We, we said, how do we how do we end up like that rather than absolutely destroyed? But there's another consideration as well, which is legality. And I would highly recommend in all instances, I know we're going to talk about preparation in a minute, but involve legal. And in some cases, it's illegal to pay, especially when it does things like fund terrorist organizations. And there are lists about that. Uh, some U.S. states are now looking to make it illegal to pay, which I, I advise against. I think, you know, notwithstanding some of the comments here, which were fantastic, you should try to not pay. But it is a risk-based decision because some businesses may not have the option. If you're a teaching hospital with hundreds of people in surgery and you can't get to data, if you're a nuclear power plant and you can't get to data, this stuff is a life and death decision. And so I would recommend that the government doesn't pass laws like that that pain at the wounded. But if you can avoid paying for reasons Brian nailed, then 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 don't, because you're just, as you said, delaying pain. Um, it's not a good strategy. And and doing the right thing is always a good policy. It is well respected in the in the industry and by Mark One human beings. And while we're going to get in one final thought, and while we'll get into the technical layer of preparation, doing an executive level cyber threat exercise slash tabletop, which is completely different from a technical one, and most people miss that, is where you have that discussion about the politics, religion, and funding that ride above the OSI model's bottom seven layers. Yeah, absolutely. And I just want to remind everybody, uh, please put your questions in, and we'll get to as many of those as we uh, can at the end. Let's let's flip over now to now that we've we've talked about whether you know what the impact to the business is whether we should pay or not um you know back to carissa's earlier comment that we really should be focusing on the prevention strategies um so sam uh what findings did the report find along those lines yeah so fa failure to plan is planning to fail um 73 percent reported that um, they have the right policies so Imagine the vast majority, nearly three quarters, saying, hey, we're ready. 42% believe that they have the right people, but less than 50 even reported having antivirus. So to the nine, you know, quite the nine points that were mentioned twice earlier, here, 73% thought they had it all, but some a number under 50% didn't even have antivirus. 30% uh, reported having an EDR solution. That's one in three. And 44% invested in endpoint protection and or EDR after a ransomware attack. So, um, you know, think think of it. Think of it as they thought they were ready. They found out they weren't, and then the spend increased anyway. So, Sam, what do you think it, it explains the low adoption rates for EPP and EDR? Well, EPP puzzles them. This is not rocket science. It's it's one of the oldest products in our industry, barring perhaps crypto and strong authentication. And uh, it's absolutely silly that that's the case. Um, you know, approaching 50% didn't have it. That's madness. EDR makes a little bit more sense because it's a newer, in, a newer, call it industry. Um, it's not really an endpoint uh, product. It, it's an endpoint telemetry for the most part, but it serves both endpoint and SOC use cases. And so I understand that it's you. It, you know, in the first part, it was the more mature organizations in a in a, in a Jeffrey Moore sense, we're getting, we went through the early adopters and the innovators and we're into the early majority. I, I get it, but we still have to get the late majority and the laggards. Um, but EPP, there's no excuse for EPP being endpoint pr protection platform, meaning antivirus and its cohorts. Uh, and that one surprised me. But the rest of you, any, any, any thoughts on why that should be so low? I, I was actually really shocked by that statistic as well. I can't imagine 50% of people not having antivirus. It's just at such an old control that's been in place forever. Um, Sam, I was actually wondering when I read the report if it was um, antivirus on specific machines or if it was antivirus, you know, across the estate. Because I think we've got a coverage problem, to be quite honest. Um, you know, poor asset inventories, poor uh, documentation, 
it's easy to miss a device here or miss a device there that then becomes a target. Um, and that problem has been known. I mean, uh, linking your asset inventory to your um, security program and making sure you have good coverage. I mean, that's been around for a while. So, um, you know, what I suspect is somewhere in here, we've got uh, controls that have been around for a really long time, but are still inefficient um, because we don't have the solid base to actually build those controls on. Um, and that, that, you know, that good solid asset inventory is critical to actually build on top of. That's an excellent set of points, Chris. The, uh, we know how ransomware spreads. It spreads like other malicious operations. The payload for which is 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 a, is a terrible you know piece of ransomware, but it takes two or three weeks to spread through an organization. So you, you might have the Windows section covered with antivirus, but I'm sure some of these folks were saying, "Oh, we didn't have it on the Mac, so we didn't have it on the Linux, or we didn't have it in the data center." So yeah, it, this might be a did you have a hundred percent interpretation by the people answering it, as opposed to did you have it at all? And Sam, I think, I think, no, go ahead, Frank, after you, please. Todd, the, no, the number that surprises me is the first one. 73% claim that they've got the right policies. Now, that number sounds very high to me, and I would argue we should dissect that a little bit. It's easy to have a documented set of cybersecurity policies. It's harder to institutionalize those policies and constantly reinforce them throughout the organization. You know, I mean, it, 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 most of the policies I see are shelfware. Is there pressure from the uh, leadership on the top to reinforce those policies on a regular basis? And, and do they set the tone from the top? Are there regular cyber audits of each one of the operating divisions or a operational agencies to continue to reinforce those policies? Are those policies regularly updated as you learn more from yourself, your own experiences, and from others? In other words, are they really living documents? Now, I would, like, I would like to see this question asked again. How many of you have policies? How many of those policies are actually living, breathing policies, top to bottom throughout your organization? I'd be willing to venture to guess the answer to question number two, the numbers would be a heck of a lot lower than 73%. Yeah, it's almost like um, CMMC. It's almost, a, uh, how, how mature are you? What score do you get? If you, so if you said, do you have all the right policies? Let's pick one, take your strong authentication policy. Um, for a, B, C, D, E, F, uh, A, B, C, D, E, F, what would you, how would you score yourself? And I bet some of the scores would be pretty low against it. And in support of that, and, and the other panelists have it nailed, is there's policies in their playbooks. I, hmm. I had a client, I was talking to CISO on a Thursday. Um, we were having a meeting on a Monday. They got ransomed on Sunday so bad they couldn't find my phone number because they couldn't get to their email. Um, they had to like, reach out to me via LinkedIn off of a personal computer. Uh, the other thing I'll say is, I think, Carissa, one of the reasons that we fail is because they're blaming the users for clicking on the link that started it. But Sam, to your point, 100%, they're not looking at the email filtering and AV integrated into their email, the endpoint protection that stops the initial infection, the uh, multi-factor auth that would stop lateral movement, the network segmentation, and the other, I won't go down the rabbit hole, but nine causes that allow a spark to turn into a fire to burn down the entire organization. So I have a Navy bias. We have watertight compartments on a ship for a reason um, that, you know, whether it's a user doing something bad or a, a, a object hitting the ship, only certain parts of it flood. Um, if that's not in place, Frank's right. The policy on the shelf doesn't help if the implementation and technical testing doesn't exist or if, you know, the playbooks of how to respond. And then one final note, and I'll hand it back to the panelists. Sam, I have seen way more now than I used to, 24 hours from initial access to completely ransomed, just done and done. They're oh, yeah. getting insanely more efficient and it's horrible. Yep. So, so how can we better defend ourselves uh, against these ransomware attacks when the, piece, the, the individuals that are doing the ransomware attack are much more funded than we are. What what can we do to to help with that? I, you know, I'll, I'll start, Todd. But Carissa mentioned it when we were discussing the last segment, and that is be as prepared as possible for the inevitable. 
The other thing I don't see listed here in the thing is, okay, policy is one thing. How seriously does the organization take incident response planning? It's much easier to have and a lot less stressful to have discussions around how would the leadership respond if something embarrassing was exfiltrated during a ransomware event? You know, that should be part of the incident response plan. Brian mentioned it too, the executive tabletops. You know, again, we get, you need to prepare for the inevitable. It's going to happen. And when it does happen, you want to be able to coolly and calmly and as efficiently as possible work through that unbelievably stressful situation. And a lot of that has to do with communication. Getting systems back online, technologists know how to do that and do that safely and securely. There's all these layers upon layers upon layers of communication. Who's responsible for calling who? Shareholders, customers, partners, executives, the media. All of that could be done ahead of time and part of any organization's incident response plan. So I'll argue, you know, the be best way to protect yourself, prevent, uh, it up, focus your time and energy on being as prepared as possible for the inevitable. And the, the other issue, and, and, and Carissa and others would be best to follow on this point is, um, the things you're doing to stop ransomware are the same things you're doing to stop bad leavers stealing your intellectual property, to stop uh, other calamities. These are not specific security improvements that only stop ransomware. They stop all the other things too, and they actually give you a better ability. And Sam, this is what the, the lean in you were talking about to manage your business. There are actually things that let you see what the business is doing from an efficiency perspective and a segmentation for mergers, acquisitions, or ultimate divestiture. There's a, the, the benefits are so more than we put in this discussion, than we, the community, not this panel, have put into the discussion. And I think this report was a good foundation to, to help that discussion. Yeah, and I mean, just building off what Brian said, um, and and actually what Frank said about preparation and and planning, um, there's been a few times in my career where I've actually ran a simulation, a tabletop simulation, um, in a manner that nobody except for a handful of people actually knew it was a simulation. Um, and what I found is that the output of a planned simulation where people are calm, um, you know, on an even keel, and they know that they're not dealing with a real scenario versus one where they believe it's true and it's actually, you know, a, a, a real incident. It tests our nature to be, to panic, which we can't actually simulate. You can't simulate that unless you put yourself under that pressure. And Frank will tell you, I guess, you know, going through what he went through, you can train and train and train, but until you're in that situation, you actually don't know how you're going to behave. And so there's been a few instances in my career where we've done this, where a handful of people actually know that it's not a real incident. And we go through until a point where um, it's either going to be we're going to go notify the media or notify the regulator or something and we go, okay, now now we need to call it. Now it's not an internal exercise anymore. Now we need to go external. And now I need to tell you, actually, it's not a real incident. Believe me, you won't be popular. That day, you're going to have a ton of people screaming at you. A week later, they're going to calm down and they're going to go, actually, we figured out a few things there that we wouldn't have figured out in the tabletop. Um, and you're better off for it afterwards. Take the pain, take the heat, take the screaming at, <laughs> get people's nerves shot up in a simulated exercise instead of in a real one. Ask that question, pay or not to pay, in that simulated pressurized environment, not when you have a real incident. That's uh, I, 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 Hey, do the simulation that everybody knows is a simulation first. <laughs> yeah, yeah. At least let them practice once or twice. Yeah. You have to a surprise game on them. <laughs> <laughs> you definitely have to. Otherwise, there will be complete chaos. <laughs> uh, and, and that's the thing is, otherwise, all you're going to do is cause that emotional strain, as opposed to test a well, hopefully vetted IR plan. So I, exactly. I agree with you, Carissa. As as an advanced 201 or 301 class for Professor Fitzgerald, yes. Um, but for the 101s, hey, get everybody in a room and talk your way through it first you may get the executive awareness to help the budget Frank and Chris are talking about. Definitely. Great, great advice. Let's, let's, my, let's, let's change gears. Jumper on those things too, for that reason, to make it real. Let's change gears and let's take a look at the way forward uh, before we get into questions. Uh, Sam, what did the, the survey find us? 
Yeah, so there's a, a, a few recommendations made for, for the way forward, and I think we've had really good conversations so far on this. Um, but first, um, ha policy, right? In the U.S., we can impose things like economic sanctions and or issue indictments. Um, we get, the big question is, can this be effective? I think I think we're seeing it now get tabled at the White House as a as a serious um, a serious policy topic in international relations and for domestic and foreign policy, and some proactive measures here as an industry, right? So. There's a ransomware task force that's been formed, and they're working on a framework to advocate unified, aggressive, public-private anti-ransomware campaigns. So uh, a lot of what we talked is what practitioners can do and, and potentially victims or potential victims. Um, this is much more we can do societally in some ways. So, And, and, and there are others in there, but th these are two that we're highlighting. Frank, what are, what are your thoughts on uh, where do we go going forward? So again, you know, I've got a, a too well-informed opinion on this, Todd, based on, you know, what I've been through. I'll start with the first one, U.S. policy. You know, we all know that a lot of uh, cyber attacks are now uh, state-sponsored by nation-state enemies, the United States of America. And, and we also know that when citizens of the United States are attacked physically, you know, the rules of engagement and the resources that the U.S. federal government specifically brings to bear to protect citizens are pretty well played out been doing it for the last 150, 200, 400 years. Well, now those same citizens are being attacked in cyberspace. You know, so the question becomes, where's the moral equivalent of cyber DOD to come to our defense? Cyber FBI or the moral equivalent. The good news is, uh, based on the comments that Sam just made, you know, the, the previous administration and the current administration recognizes that DHS is CISA, Critical Infrastructure Cybersecurity Agency, you know, is kind of the center point of activity for laying the groundwork to do just that, but an awful long way to go. With respect to the second point here, what do we do in the meantime? You know, our best resource is each other. I mean, the, the stuff that you do, Todd, and uh, at the Cybersecurity Collaborative, providing an opportunity for systems to come together and learn from each other. I mean, we just need to be doing more of that. The RTF, great, yeah. We are still at base camp in both of these areas. And I wanna go back to something that Brian talked about early on. He mentioned small and medium business. Well, I spend a lot of time in the public sector, you know, and, I, and I've, I've been on both sides of the desk recently as a customer, a consumer of cybersecurity capability, and now back again as a supplier. And I'll argue as an industry, we tend to be very large enterprise focused. LE, the LE market. By the way, the LE market is defined as 100,000 employees and above. By the way, there's less than 50,000 of those in the United States of America. There are over 32 million SMBs. Who's helping them? And I work a lot in the public sector now, and I actually work with some very, very small municipalities where the deputy sheriff is also the network engineer. And by the way, he drives a snow plow in the wintertime when there's a snow emergency. Who's helping them? So, I mean, we have an awful long way to go in order to help each other. Federal government has a role to play, state and local authorities. But, you know, in the meantime, I'll argue that the best resource we have is each other. When I was going through the Baltimore City ransomware event, I reached out to another public sector CIO who had been through a similar event two years prior. I, he was the most valuable resource that I had available to me as an advisor learning from others anyway it's my point it wouldn't it have been great to, wouldn't it have been great to have that information and that knowledge uh, ahead of time right and you know to be able to to you know put some prevention strategies in or, or look at things in a different in a different way on top of what you were already doing that's why you know I'm such a huge fan of this, the collaborative. And for those of you that aren't familiar with the Cybersecurity Collaborative and aren't members and you are CISOs listening, and I would encourage you to join. That's exactly it. A, gr a group of smart, well-intentioned people who have been there providing lessons learned and helping each other. You know, we just need to continue to do more of that. And then the question then becomes, how do we help out the millions of small and medium businesses who don't have dedicated CISOs in their environments or enterprise. What are we doing to help them? We've got a long way to go in that space, Todd. So how important do you think these public-private partnerships are, like the uh, ransomware task force? 
uh, in in helping with this, helping solve this issue? I'll, I'll take a swing at that. Uh, very much so. Thirty years ago, when I started uh, the program for the U.S. Navy, we reached out. Um, we had a criminal that had uh, taken all the Social Security numbers of admirals and generals from the congressional record when they digitized it in the mid 90s and was creating bank accounts. Now, this is in the, many of you may not have been born at that point, um, in 93, 94 timeframe. Um, and then they were creating bank accounts and credit card accounts. Identity theft did not exist at the time as a concept and freezing your credit was not actually a thing. Uh, so we had to go with USAA and the three credit bureaus and figure out a public-private partnership. That has come a long way. Um, there's also a cyber NTSB, Frank, that I was on with Richard Clark and, and a bunch of others were talking about how to do that. And I've talked to some of the senators at my last job, when I, or the job a couple ago when I was Microsoft's chief of cybercrime, about this being a clear and present danger to the United States six years ago. And here's the thing we don't do with terrorism. You don't tell people when you travel, don't get shot. And if you do get shot, we're gonna shoot you again because we're gonna say you funded terrorism by accepting bullets. It's not the way it works in any other parts of the terrorism and attacks on our country. I don't know why there's a blind spot for cyber, but I will agree removing all politics because I'm a career bureaucrat from my younger misspent days on the wall behind me. Um, the administrations are getting better about at least talking about cyber and bringing CISA and others to inform companies they're in trouble. Now, they don't have any solutions yet, um, but it's it's moving in the right direction, but it needs to move faster. So I, I, I love, and the collaborative, the final thing I'll say to support that uh, has two levels for this reason, an enterprise level and an SMB level where many of us dedicate our time to try and help those armies of one or SEAL teams of three plucky little startups or municipalities because nobody's talking to them about how to secure a, a small important group when you have no resources. Sure. And by the way, I, I, I just want to add to that, we can network ahead of time. Meaning we talked about preparation earlier. If somebody's been through this and when the dust is settled, make them part of your Rolodex. Call them up and say, if I have a similar incident, can I call you? I mean, part of the preparation in the tabletop that Carissa talked about is, in case of emergency, break glass and call whom? So I, I think you, we can do that before an incident comes. And, and as dumb as this sounds, and Todd's heard me say it before, print out your ransomware playbook because you won't be able to access your computer systems if you're using it. Yeah, we, <laughs> we, we still have a use for paper, right? <laughs> still, still has a role. So um, this is a, a great report. Um, you know, I appreciate all the comments on the panel. Uh, this is where you can get the report. Uh, it has a you know a lot more detail uh, in the report. I think it's a fantastic report uh, talking about this cost to the business because this is really um, you know at the level that we need to be discussing it. Uh, we also have the CISO Stories podcast, uh, where this will be put uh, part of. Uh, we, we're on episode uh, 28 uh, at the moment. Uh, we've been, we, we have schedules going way out. Uh, we have many different leaders uh, in this space that, that have contributed great content to this. Uh, you can get this on the Security Weekly uh, website, uh, the Cyber Reason uh, website, uh, or you can uh, uh, download it on your favorite uh, podcasting platform. Um, so um, let's let's flip over to the questions. Uh, one of the questions that we have: uh, What are the big secure biggest security challenges when it comes to edge computing with respect to ransomware? Or is that just a, another thing to be concerned about? I'll, no. I'll, 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 oh, sorry. No, Sam, I'm, you're, you're you know, Todd, you know, <laughs> you know, Obvious number one, the attack service begins to grow. And not up until recently, IoT or security built into IoT devices was not a priority for those supplying smart, intelligent, connected devices to one sprawling network. The other challenge for the IT leadership in the CISO is, you know, we used to have very clearly defined boundaries around where our systems were. Heck, when there was one big system, it was easy. It was in that building over there and it was locked. 
But now in this hyper-connected world where your customers, your partners, your suppliers, two or three levels deep are part of your enterprise and your digital supply chains, man, being able to, I mean, it's just, it, it just the growing complexity exacerbated by IoT just makes our jobs that much more difficult in order to keep and defend and our, keep our enterprises safe. And it needs to be an area of focus. There's a number of vendors that are starting to take hard looks at it, but yeah, it's just, it's a challenge for us. Do you have another question that came in here? Is uh, how effective can we expect the US foreign policy to be in quelling the attacks? I think uh, we expect yeah. I think we expect that it won't and hope that it will. I mean, certainly from the dialogues we're seeing, the potential exists. If the dialogue wasn't there, it wouldn't exist at all. So I think we have to participate in our own rescue and and, and take care of ourselves and hope that the government creates a a better in, in, in collaboration with other governments and, and, the, and the international community creates a better environment for us all, but we can't count on it. Brian, you were going to say something. Yeah, I... Seconded. Uh, well, at the national level, the state sponsored attacks might continue. It's the safe havens of where the organized crime groups, and you're talking about an ecosystem of evil. You're not talking about one or two groups or, 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 or a, a regiment thing. You're talking about just this is a multi-tiered marketing where people ransoming individuals or small businesses are not the ones attacking, you know, the Fortune 50. It, it, those are all different groups. Nothing is going to stop those, period. You might name and shame. You might convict a bunch. You might get the Al Capones of ransomware extradited from the Ukraine or other places. But the attacks will continue nonstop. I it just, I wish it weren't the case, and I, I, I wish there was things we could do, but it just as, a, as an IT professional on this call, yeah, that's a great thing to read about in the newspaper. That's not going to affect your job. Well, I think that's a good place to leave it. Um, I'd like to thank the panelists, uh, thank everybody that attended today. Um, please uh, go look at this report, uh, the ransomware, uh, the uh, true cost to the business report. Um, and uh, thank you very much to our panelists. Thank you. Thanks very much, Cyber Reason, for having us. Really appreciate it. <laughs> thank you, thank Cyber Reason and Todd, yes. Thank Thanks, Todd. everyone. And I'll just add that if you did register for this, you will be getting the recording sent directly to you, in addition to these places you can find the report and the podcast itself. Thanks, everyone.